Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to the session. I'm hoping uh, this will be a useful and uh, informative session for all of you. Um, so yeah, uh, so our title is uh, Rhythm of Revenue. Um, so the, the title might be a bit misleading because I'm not really going to talk about revenue. I'm not a revenue specialist in, in, in any ways. I'm a software engineer. I work at Markov ML. I primarily work on the front end side of uh, uh, Markov. And right now I'm working closely with the growth team uh, you know, to, to make sure that things are in order and uh, uh, we have things in motion. So, uh, uh, so that way I, I, I have a little idea about revenue and that's what we're going to discuss here. Um, but, but before that, uh, the story behind the fancy title, uh, Rhythm of Revenue, right? Um, so uh, uh, Nick had sent us an email that, hey, everybody needs to send their titles in. So we're like, okay, we know what, what we want to present on uh, in general. We knew the description of our presentation. So what we did, we went ahead, you know, Gen AI is all there and whatnot. So we went to ChatGPT. I wrote a small description. Hey, so I want to give a talk on this and this and this. Can you provide a title for the talk? So it gave me some title. Then Nick was like, no, we need something which is, you know, disco and something zazzy and whatnot. So I was like, okay, make this title rhyming and zazzy. So then uh, it gave me something which me and Sharath, we both didn't like. So we're like, okay, give five more examples. And then it gave us five, five more examples and then, you know, we chose the first one. So that's how we ended up coming with the title of our presentation. Yeah, I mean, subjective. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, it was like, yeah, we'll go with the first one. Sounds okay to us. And then, and then yeah, we did post it on our Markov ML uh, Slack channel as well. Uh, people did like it, so we were like, let's go with this. Uh, so thank you, ChatGPT, for that. Um, yeah, so that's that's all it is. So uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, we're going to talk about uh, SaaS products, software as a service, and uh, we're going to talk about how uh, people are developing SaaS products, and then how uh, you know revenue can be generated out of that, or how people have been doing that, and then a little bit into how. Markov is trying to do that. Um, so that'll be something that uh, I'll, I'll try to go deep into. Now today in the morning, Herschel was uh, like, you know, in 1993 or four, they used to go and, you know, uh, deploy, so they, they used to go to the, um, the clients and then deploy software there. Now it's all cloud-based. So, uh, you know, companies need to figure out what's the right way to actually uh, get revenue out of them also. Um, and I want to I want to go a little bit into that. So, how many developers in the house right now? Okay, quite a few developers. So, when we talk about SaaS product or when we talk about you know software in general, I believe this what you see on the slides uh, is what we actually do. So, we do road mapping, we do the solution architecture, we develop, we test, optimize, we deploy, and then this is the whole software lifecycle journey, if you think about it. Now, uh, because most of us are developers, this is where our territory lies. That, yeah, I need, uh, like somebody has told me, this is what we need to develop. Uh, we just take care of the engineering side, we just take care that you know, the platform is stable, uh, we develop it, we test it, we make sure that no customer faces any issues. This is what generally uh, most of us are doing. Uh, but then, there's a macro picture where the CEO or the CTO or you know the revenue people, they're looking at a different aspect. So they're looking at a much broader aspect as to how uh, you, know, you can develop your product or how the product life cycle should really go like. So what's go what goes on in the other side, the non-engineering side. So basic basically people are envisioning what their product should look like. Then they're evaluating different platforms. They're planning what they need to build they are planning, like they are uh, building subscription models, or they are building how they can get uh, revenue out of it, and then they start the development, and then the operation hell that again uh, Harshal was talking about that goes on, and then that's a cycle. So this is what at a macro level things are. So I want to focus more on the subscription thing, uh, the subscribing thing. You know where 
uh, like how somebody can actually, uh, how somebody thinks about building the product and uh, what, is the, what, what is the important thing that you need to build and whatever you have built, is it the right thing that the customers are actually using the way you intended, intended them to use? So that's what uh, I'll go into. So uh, like we all, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are all working in different companies. We're all writing software and building software and whatnot. But at the end of the day, what does business really care about? Any guesses? It's revenue, yes. Uh, and in a different word, it's like cash. So if you can generate cash, if your software can generate cash, you're good. If you can't, you'll die after a while. So this is what is the most important thing that uh, sustains every business. And this is what we are all working towards. So now the next question, can you sell your software without really having salespeople? Because generally there are salespeople who go door to door or who go person to person and then they're selling your software. Can you do that? I'm, I'm guessing we don't have a lot of salespeople in, in Superset. Uh, so let's think of early stage companies. Can you really hire salespeople? Because that itself is a tough thing for, like it's already tough to hire engineers. Now you also have to hire salespeople, so that's going to be tougher. So uh, there's this different paradigm that uh, has started uh, a co quite a while back, and then I think Markov is also piggy banking on that strategy, uh, which is called product-led growth. So what this means is, like you know, in the past, what used to happen is uh, people have salespeople. They go to you know, uh, individual companies or whoever your customers are. They pitch their product. They give a demo, and then they sell. Uh, and then they build a contract and whatnot, and then this, and then they sell. Now there's this different other thing where a lot of companies are already doing it, where uh, you build a product and then uh, people start using it, and then they figure out, oh, I really want to, uh, you know, use this product more. And then that's where the company, whoever is doing PLG, product led growth, is actually saying, hey, you need to pay us some money so you can start using the rest of the things. And then people are like, yeah, why not? I'll use it. So that's where you know revenue starts coming, where you don't really need salespeople to do something. Maybe you have a few marketing folks, maybe you have a few growth uh, you know, uh, department or growth folks who are just driving you know, the right uh, people having, uh, the right people using a platform. And then once you have that in place, the revenue automatically comes in. So that's where the new cycle of product-led growth is. Think about, um, Think about Gmail. I think uh, whenever any teenager, he starts coming into the world of internet, I, I believe most of them will start with Gmail because almost every software has a sign in with Google button right now. So if you start with Gmail, you have a full-fledged experience of what Gmail gives the inbox and whatnot. And then slowly when you come into the industry world, you realize, oh, there's something called Google Workspace, which is like Gmail, but for business. And then now suddenly Google is making a lot of money out of all those things, right? So that's, also, that's, a, that's an example of what PLG could be. So I took Google as an example because it's a long-term game for Google because by the time you started using Gmail and by the time you ended up with a subscription of Google Workspace, it's a long time, but at least it's a very good game that they played, I feel, personally, that uh, at the end of the day, enterprises started using uh, you know, Google for, for a simple thing like a mail. So that, 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 was, that was, I think, a very smart move that Google took, uh, Google took, and then I believe that's how they're slowly outpacing uh, Microsoft, because I remember Microsoft used to do a sales led model where uh, they used to go to each company and they used to be like, hey, use Outlook and use this and that, but now people are, more newer startups are shifting towards Google Workspace and Gmail, so yeah. So now, uh, if you are a software company, if you need to figure out whether you're good enough for PLG. The first question, and probably the only most important question you need to ask, is your product good enough that you don't need a manual, right? If you remember, uh, so I'll take a, so I, I really love this manual thing where uh, uh, the company that comes to my mind where, where I don't need a manual is Apple. So when Apple builds iPhones or uh, you know any, any device that they build, it comes with a small manual, but nobody really is looking at that manual. You get an iPhone, you turn it on, and then you exactly know what you want to do. 
So, or, or even if you don't know what you want to do, you're still figuring out and then you can just do some button presses, oh, this does this, this does that, stuff like that. So, uh, I feel like iPhone uh, that Apple made was a really good product so it's not a software product, obviously, it's a hardware product, but it was a really good product where you don't really need to go into the manual and you can start using it and then you can start buying their apps and then you go into their ecosystem and then you start buying MacBooks, you start buying AirTags, you start buying a lot of things. So uh, in terms of product-led growth, this is like, I feel this is another example where uh, you don't need a manual and then yet you're able to use the product and then yet, and then from there you start building out your business and then you start uh, you know, getting people in. So this is the important question to ask. Is your product good enough that you don't need a manual? Can somebody just sign in and use your product and don't even need to talk to support at any point in the journey? If yes, good enough. In fact, we a lot of places I see we have a book demo, book a demo, or a kind of a button, like, you know, a CTA button. Uh, I would even argue, do we really need that? If you, if you, if you think that you can go away with that button, you're good for product-led growth. Rather have a sign-in button or a sign-up button, and then user can directly click on that, go into the product, and then start using it. And slowly, you start monetizing. So uh, if, you, if you are in that model where you know that your product is good enough, that you don't need a manual, you need to know what your users are doing, because that's how you'll uh, you know, start monetizing. Because if you know what your users are doing, uh, that makes it very easy. Uh, to see that, okay, these are the things users are doing, I'll let them do this, but there's this one thing that I'll not let them do, they'll have to probably pay for it. So uh, that kind of, a, so that's, that's the kind of model that you could possibly take, there are other models that you can take, but at the end of the day, you'd still need to know what your users are doing. And for this, uh, enter user analytics. So uh, basically, get the users, uh, get the, uh, uh, so, uh, try to understand what users are doing, right? Uh, so this is, so uh, you need to know when people are signing up, what are they really doing? You can't really go into their work and see, oh, this is what they have done. No, not this. So we need to really figure out if without interfering in their actual work, can we figure out what are the users doing and what are the important steps they are taking so that, uh, you know, things can, so that you can make proper decisions later on. So how does user analytics at Marco ML drive growth and product decisions? So uh, previously, what, when we started uh, a couple of years back, what we used to do uh, was we knew that we had to build a certain thing, like we had a roadmap in place and whatnot, and then uh, we started building out the first iteration of the product, and then uh, we went to the customers, and then the customers started using it, and then we realized, okay, uh, so at that point of time, we didn't really, like, we had not implemented user analytics. That was not our first uh, thought process. So we wanted to, but we didn't. And then uh, we realized, okay, we need user analytics to know what they're actually doing. So we were internally talking to customers, we were trying to figure out what they're really doing, but we didn't have user analytics in place. So this is a very uh, recent thing that we've done, and whatever I'm going to present after this is, uh, you know, the learnings that we've had uh, in, in the very recent times. So, uh, so we're using a lot of different tools to do user analytics. Uh, one is Amplitude, uh, other is Hotjar, then Metabase, and we're also using Snowflake. So I'll, I'll go through how uh, we're using these tools so that any, any company in Superset can actually also use this and maybe reap the benefits that uh, we have ripped out. Uh, but before I do this, I'll have to uh, give a small small sort of a demo as to what Marco ML does today. Uh, so that, okay, yeah, so that, um, yeah, so that uh, it's easy for you to understand uh, the events that I'm going to talk about after this. So Marco ML in general, what it does, like Pankas has already given a very brief uh, uh, definition in the introduction session, but what it generally does is that you have uh, in AI, when you're talking about uh, models and whatnot, you'll have data. So what we do is, you can upload your data with us or you can register your data with us. It can be on your own cloud, doesn't matter. And we will generate insights for you, right? And then you can look at this, look at those insights and then you can figure out, oh, uh, is this data set good, for, good enough for me or is it not, right? This is what Markov's, one of the propositions is. 
So I'm going to take that as an example, and then I'm going to go through how we have uh, taken user analytics, like how we have you know, taken, uh, how we have uh, done the user analytics part of it. Uh, so basically when you add uh, or when you, when you log in, this is the screen that comes up today. I'll show you what it was before and then how it came up to be this. And I'll also take you through a process where if you want to add a new data set, so there are three steps in the process and then uh, now what we are doing and how we are figuring out whether this is the right way to do or not. So I'll go through that uh, next. So just wanted to make sure that uh, you guys know what Markov does so that it, it becomes easy to understand the next slide. So uh, I want to talk about the tools and how we have implemented that uh, and how we've been making decisions based on the output of these tools. Uh, so one is Amplitude. So Amplitude is basically, uh, it helps you capture user events, so it's analytics. And then you can see all the events, like in this uh, slide you can see, all the events are uh, right about there for that particular user. So essentially what are the different things that the user really did uh, throughout his journey. So this is just some of them. Uh, this is, I think, Ram from Spectrum who has done all this. Uh, so these are very simple events that we're capturing that somebody clicked on data set details, somebody clicked on the nav bar in data set, uh, like there's a data set uh, nav bar, so somebody clicked there, then somebody clicked on different tabs of the details page, uh, and then he was doing some viewing around and all. So, uh, and then how much time he spent on each of that page. Uh, so somebody who wants to look at this can easily figure out all these data from here. And uh, this has been really helpful for us to understand what is it that the user is really clicking on. So our product offers a lot of features. Uh, it's a very featureful product, but we still didn't know like what is it that the user is using most, right? And then now this is really helping us do that, where we figure out, hey, so we have a models feature, is the customer using that or not? So from this diagram at least, it's not. So uh, that way, uh, it's helping us out in making sure that we are developing the right thing uh, and we're focusing our efforts in the right place. The next thing is Amplitude also, uh, what it does is it, it helps us understand uh, how many new users you've added and because it's, all, it's capturing a lot of events and all these are uh, provided out of box. Amplitude as soon as you start capturing events. So uh, we've been doing that, we've been figuring out, okay, how many users are there how many are dormant users, how many are actually doing something, how many are just logging in and doing nothing. Uh, so all these kinds of data, it's, it's been pretty helpful to understand. Uh, so this one is like data, data set registration. So I just showed you how registration happens. So it's a multi-step process. So the first one is like, how many people actually went to the data sets page, the add data set page, and then how many actually completed the process. So uh, we do realize that not everybody is doing that, and what that means is uh, the registration process is probably more complicated than we had expected it to be. So this was a learning for us. And then this, so you know, every company in Superset can have ser such learnings where when they're using the product, you figure out, okay, uh, this doesn't work for me. So uh, the customers are not really using it the way I intended them to use. So that means there's something wrong. Now, uh, right now, because of this, what we're doing is we're revamping our flow, making it slightly more easy uh, seeing what information we really need and what we don't need. And then uh, we'll change that accordingly and then you know, uh, proceed from there uh, to make sure that the person who lands on uh, data set addition, like the first screen, does complete all the screens or at least he has data sets registered with us. So we want to make sure that uh, uh, you know, uh, we're able to make the user go through that flow. So the intention here is so in product led growth, I believe the intention is that the user should start something and he should be able to complete that and he should be able to complete that easily. If he's able to do that, then uh, that means that's the first uh, success criteria for you that, hey, yes, you have done the right thing. Uh, so we're still figuring this out and then now we are revamping the flow and stuff. So this is the learning that we've had from Amplitude and this has been super helpful for us and the growth team. Uh, similarly, on the right, uh, like you know, what, what are the different things that the users are really clicking on to figure out which feature is really standing out? So that's helping helping us as well. Uh, for the devs, if you want to set up Android, it's pretty easy. Uh, like you can just sign up, and then 
uh, you can start creating events. Uh, these events, uh, so basically every click or every event that you want to capture, you'll have to register them separately. The registration is this, uh, you just write the name, you just give some properties, and then that's it. So this event creation can be done by a developer, it can be done by a product manager, it can be done by anybody. Whoever wants whatever kind of events, uh, you can directly do it on the dashboard of Amplitude. And then uh, whatever events you create here, these events are actually directly available on the front end side. So uh, Amplitude provides uh, a wrapper called Ampli. So what this does is it automatically gives you typed events, right, on TypeScript. If, you're, if, if anyone is on TypeScript here, uh, it'll give you typed events. So for example, if you created an event, in our case, we created an event called dataset registration landed, uh, and then we had two properties where we have a workflow ID and a workspace ID, we, we capture these events. Uh, on front end, if you were to do Ampli, so in, in line number seven, you can see there's an Ampli.song played. Instead of that, instead of that, it would have been Ampli.dataset register landed, and then it would need the two arguments. If you don't, then TypeScript will throw you an error. So that way what happens is, in case the product, peop the product managers or the growth managers are creating these events for you, it's very easy to create a synergy between uh, the product side and the engineering side to make sure that the right events are getting captured. And that's how Amplitude, that's how we've been using Amplitude and that's how we're making sure that business and uh, engineering is on sync and making sure the right events are getting captured and making sure that uh, you know we're taking the right decisions uh, when we're using the product. So that's, that's what, uh, uh, that's how I've been using Amplitude so far. Uh, the next product uh, that we've been using is Hotjar. Uh, so Hotjar is basically, it captures uh, whatever your users are doing. It'll hide all the sensitive thing that it feels are sensitive. Uh, and then, um, yeah, so it'll, it'll do all that capturing for you. And then uh, you can go and later on view the recordings of what those users have done. Uh, you can also uh, look at the heat map. So this, this particular slide is talking about uh, heat maps. So what this means is where are the users clicking, right? on the slide, uh, sorry, on the page. So the, in Amplitude, it's good to see what events uh, somebody really went through. So if you, if you look at this, it goes, it's good to see for a user what events that uh, have been clicked. But in general, we would also like to know uh, if somebody is landing on this particular page, where are they clicking most, right? Uh, and, and, and one thing that we realized, uh, which we didn't realize when we were building this, was the explore marker ML section nobody was really clicking on any of those buttons, right? And that was like the most important real estate that we were consuming. So this was like a, uh, uh, this was like a good learning for us where we realized that this is not making much sense. And then uh, John, uh, John joined us as, as the growth uh, lead and then uh, he figured out, hey, nobody's actually clicking on this. Why do you have it in the central place of your app and somebody's going to land there? It's, it's not making any sense. And then we're like, okay, that makes a lot of sense now. So uh, then, then we had Hotjar in place and then we looked at all the heat maps and then we realized, yeah, nobody's actually doing that. So it was not like John coming us and telling us, hey, this doesn't work. It's like he has real data to show now, this doesn't work. So we were like, yes, it doesn't work. So what we did, we quickly went and then we removed this entire section. We realized most people are using data sets. So if you see right now there's projects uh, as uh, an important piece after this. So we revamped it, like not revamped, but we slightly moved things around. And then we came up with this kind of a design now. And then now if you see, uh, there are actions that are happening here. So essentially, uh, people are clicking on the left-hand side. Uh, that's the nav menu anyways. Then we put data sets on the top. Now what that does is, people are interacting with data sets. We know that people are interacting with data sets. Most of our customers or uh, you know, the ads that we're running uh, are based on data sets. So it made sense that we put data sets on the top and then we were trying to see if there are going to be clicks on that. And then uh, it so happens that there are, there are clicks on that. So that way, uh, that way we're slowly figuring out what are the things that the users are doing, where are they clicking, what are the activities they're doing, and then that is helping us shape our product in the right way. And then uh, we feel this is going to be very important if you want to do PLG, uh, product life growth that is, Reason being, uh, this makes sure uh, that the next, 
new customer who signs up with you uh, knows exactly what to do and like you know you have already targeted the product uh, to that experience so this has been a really helpful thing for us so far and these are the major two tools that we have used which has helped us make sure that we have the right things in place and if you want to install hotjar hotjar has a very simple script that you just copy and uh, put it on your uh, index.html file in the head section and it does all the heavy lifting for you so it's very easy to install hotjar and do all this uh, for those who who are not doing it and who want to do it uh, so this is all good so we figured out okay uh, we are uh, we know what the users are doing we know uh, we know that they are interacting with something and then we know that some things are not working, so we reject that, and then uh, we build up the new you know, UI, uh, a shiny new UI, or you know, at least something <coughs> that feels that it's working, and the users are really interacting with that. Now, but how to make money? Still, we, we haven't answered that question yet. So uh, to understand that how you want to make money, first you also have to understand what is really costing you, right? Uh, because based on that, you will also determine how much you want to price your things or what is the, uh, like how much of a thing would you want to give as a free trial and then what you don't want to give as a free trial. So all these decisions uh, you can make once you know how much is being used. So as an as a early stage company, it's important for you to figure out, you have built a bunch of stuff, you need to figure out, okay, what is it that the users are actually doing and then what is it that is costing us and how much is it costing us today? So uh, we also, like apart from the uh, user analytics, we also want to do, we also want to understand what is, what is it that is really, you know, uh, what is it that we are really spending money on apart from engineering expense. Uh, so enter usage tracking. So this is another system that we built uh, sort of in-house using Metabase and Snowflow, Snowflake, uh, where uh, we want to understand what the users are doing in terms of the cost that we are incurring, right? So the first one was trying to understand, okay, uh, what are the pro what, what is the user doing in the product? What is making sense and what is not making sense? Now we are talking about uh, when the users are doing whatever they're supposed to do, how much is it costing us, right? And then we can figure out, okay, how to make money out of that, like how to make money from that. Because once you have hooked the users, I believe it's slightly easy to actually, uh, you know, uh, get, uh, like, once you have hooked the user, it's easy to get money out of that. Because, for example, if you look at, uh, let, let's take the Apple ecosystem, right? If you are on a Mac or if you have an iPhone, it's very easy for you that you get an Apple Watch. It's, it's like a no-brainer. Uh, it's very easy if you get an AirPods. It's very easy if you get something else. So what we are also trying to do is, uh, get the users hooked up, get them to use the product in a, in a way that they don't want to come out of it. Like they can definitely go out of it, but uh, it doesn't make sense for them to go out of it because then there are a lot of additional things that you provide which actually makes a lot of sense. Now to do all that, you need to understand, okay, coming back to, uh, you need to understand what's costing you. So in our case, uh, we need to figure out what cost you money. And in our case, uh, the cloud is one of the larger expenses that we incur. Uh, in, in our case, it happens to be Fargate and Lambda from AWS. So uh, the events that the user are doing, let's say you register a data set, or you run a model experiment, or you run an evaluation, uh, how much is it costing us? How much are the users really, like right now it's all free tier. So everybody can do anything that they want. Now we need to figure out how much limit do we keep, right? We don't know that answer yet. So we need to see how much are the users really doing to make sure that they are successful in doing some things so that they are hooked up and then later on we can charge them money for you know, going to the next level. So what we've done is we've used Metabase to, so all this data that you're going to see is on dev environment. This is not, an, uh, this is, this is not the data from prod. So you will see a lot of users uh, who are from Markov uh, doing a lot of stuff on dev. Um, so, so we need to see uh, what are the users really doing, right? And how much are they consuming when they're, when they're doing stuff? For example, I can say that, hey, I'm gonna give you a 50 GB limit of uploading data set. Like you cannot upload more than 50 GB. Now how do I determine that number of 50 GB, right? 
uh, let's say if I'm going with a free tier plan and then I'm going to give you 50 GB, how do I determine whether it should be 50 GB or 100 GB or whatnot? So uh, for that, I also need to understand how much are the users actually you know, uh, using? Like for example, maybe they might be using, uh, uh, they might be uploading only MBs of data. So it's okay if I give them uh, one GB and that's not costing me a lot of money, then I'm okay with giving them, let's say, uh, one GB of uh, free storage because throughout the user journey, nobody has uploaded more than a couple of MBs, let's say. If that's the case, then I know that even if I give a smaller limit, that's fine. And then somebody, once they exhaust that one GB limit, they would probably take, uh, you know, buy more, right? So that's the intention. So we need to figure out what is the important things that they are using and then how much are they using so we can price our uh, packages accordingly. So this is like when you upload a data set, we run analysis on them. So how much analysis, so how much, how much consumption was there for each of the data sets that they uploaded, right? So this is one such graph. Then there is like uh, users uploaded data sets. Now how much uh, on a daily basis people are uploading, on a monthly basis how much are they uploading? So that kind of graph. And then uh, you have uh, model experiments and evaluations. So how much experiments are they uploading? How much evaluations are they uploading? All these kinds of, how much are they keeping track of? So we get that data. So again, this is all uh, dev data, so don't go around with the actual data, but uh, in fraud, the same thing will happen. And then we also have a feature of notebooks, so how much are the people using notebooks? Like are they uh, using it for uh, 10 hours straight, or are they using it for two hours, or like what not, right? So uh, so this way, we're using, uh, we're using uh, data to figure out what's the right plan that we want to really offer when we say that we're going to give you this plan. Right? Whether it should be a one GB, whether it should be a hundred GB, whether it should be uh, in terms of compute, whether it's a hundred hours of compute that we're going to give you, or ten hours of compute that we're going to give you. So, if we have the right data to do that, it'll become very easy for us to plan uh, our subscriptions accordingly and make money out of it. So, uh, in our case, we've used MetaBase and we're also using Amplitude. So, right now, what's happening is uh, you do event like you do stuff in Markov, event goes to Amplitude, we send all those events to Snowflake. And then uh, MetaBase is just a UI on top of Snowflake. So uh, what this does is, uh, and then you can write queries on MetaBase. So now you have all the data that you want. You can write any query that you want, and then you can figure out. Uh, so all these charts that you saw over here, all these are just queries over uh, all the events that we have just captured. And then uh, now it makes it very easy for anyone who knows how to write query uh, to get as many graphs as you want and as many data as you want. And then it's all in a visual form, so it makes a lot of sense for the product managers or uh, let's say the revenue guys to figure out, okay, this is how we want to uh, price our product. So uh, this is what, uh, yeah, so this is it. So in, in this particular case, uh, we wrote a small query where uh, we want to see any event that is happening on in terms of data set, what's, uh, is there any event happening in terms of data set? So like, uh, these are all the users who have, so this is the graph it generated basically. This particular query that you see here, uh, it generated this graph. So uh, so this way it becomes very, very helpful to understand, okay, uh, what's what's the usage for your system? And then now, now if you want to build a freemium model, let's say you want to have uh, some sort of a plan where you can use things for free, it's always free. And then now you want, and then you want to build subscription <coughs> tiers on top of that. Like you have pricing phases, every, every software has pricing phases, right? So uh, this is how we're thinking um, of building our pricing strategy uh, going forward. So we, we don't have a pricing strategy yet, uh, as a disclaimer, but uh, uh, we feel that this there's a stepping stone to that, and then now, very soon enough, we're going to have that. Um, so yeah, so we're going with a freemium model for now where things are going to be free forever, uh, but then there's going to be a limit. And then what's that limit? We're deciding based on all this data that we're capturing here, right? Uh, so enter subscription packages. So right now, how Markov is thinking about pricing, uh, and this, of course, this is subject to change, uh, but we have a starter plan, which is basically a free plan. So the idea is get the users hooked up, right? And then you let them play with almost all features, but you limit the usage. So for example, what that usage is going to be like, we don't know that. We, we don't have the answer for that yet, but we're gonna figure that out. 
uh, and then we're going to have a limit of that usage. So people can start using the product. They can do whatever they want until they have not exhausted that usage. Now the idea is that if people are able to do that without really contacting support, then they would most likely be willing to upgrade, right? Uh, you want to upgrade some usage. Maybe you're using notebooks a lot more, so you want to upgrade, uh, hey, uh, like let's say Markov provides 10 hours of usage of notebook uh, compute. So we'll be like, okay, uh, I'll upgrade to 100 hours because my team needs it now. So that kind of uh, upgradation process, if it happens, then you're already in a product-led growth uh, model, right? Where you, di you really didn't need to contact support or sales or all these guys to figure out that I really need to buy software. So if, if that happens, then you're already doing uh, product-led growth. And then uh, we're also thinking of an enterprise, this thing, so this probably uh, will feel like a sales-led uh, model, but the idea here is that once somebody is on Teams, when they want more features, when they want more premium things, and then when, if they want custom features, uh, we could build out for them, and then that'll be a different price package altogether for the enterprises. Uh, but yeah, this is the idea that uh, we think will work, and uh, we're going ahead uh, with this kind of strategy. So, yeah. Uh, so if, if I have to talk about starter, I think this is, uh, in, in a product-led growth, uh, we need to figure out how to you know, crack the starter plan or the free plan. Uh, in this case, we're trying to figure out, uh, so the entire presentation was actually just to figure out what the starter plan should be like. So in our case, uh, you find out the usage from the usage tracking system, you, f you figure out the right values for each of the most important usage metrics, then you update your subscription packages and the limits accordingly, right? So you get data, you figure out stuff, uh, and then you change your package accordingly. And then when you, when you know what the sweet spot is, that's when you've made it. So that's, that's uh, yeah, well, that's how you'll make money. So yeah, tying this all up together, uh, PLG and money, right? Like revenue. So um, essentially, the idea is that you figure out what the users are doing. You figure out uh, if they are doing things by themselves and they don't really have to, uh, they don't really need support. And then you just uh, run from there. And then you, you, you make tons of money, hopefully. Yep, that's all. Uh, any questions? Yes? So I think, I think it's an extension uh, of what you're already building. And then, uh, so I think how, it, how, how we think about it is, uh, we, build, uh, we build the simplest, most important thing, right? And then that same team can focus on, hey, what's the next thing that the user really wants, right? And then is he willing to pay that extra money for that? If that money can justify the effort that you're making, it's okay, right? At the end of the day, you want to make money. So if, if uh, the customer is willing to pay that kind of money and then you know that you can scale it to a larger audience, then why not? Let's go with it. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Woo